Rummaging around in tiger poo might seem like a very unhealthy and slightly unsettling pastime for most people, but the RZSS conservation team love it, and by the end of this episode of RZSS Goes Wild, you too will understand why tiger poo is a really helpful tool in helping conserve the biggest big cat on the planet. <laughs> The Royal Zoological Society of Scotland's conservation department is all about conservation success. But sometimes, a successful conservation project can bring unexpected challenges. That's exactly the problem being faced by people working on tiger conservation in Nepal. And for today's episode, I'm going to be teaming up with Dr. Alex Ball, who I normally share an office with, and who is our program manager for our Wild Genes Conservation Genetics Lab, um, to explain exactly what's going on with tiger conservation in Nepal, and how DNA from tiger poo can help us conserve this amazing species. The status of tigers in Nepal is actually one of the world's conservation success stories. In 2010, 13 countries where wild tigers still remain all pledged to double the size of their wild populations by 2022. Nepal is set to be the first country to achieve this aim, with now over 200 tigers uh, remaining in wild populations. However, this success brings with it other challenges. How does an expanding human population cope and interact with an expanding tiger population. Many people in the Tarai region of Nepal are living near buffer zones around national parks. These are kind of two kilometre wide strips that are designed to keep both humans and wildlife safe. As the tiger populations within the national parks in Nepal increase, they begin to look for new territories and to use the buffer zones to search for prey. This means that they're much more likely to come in contact with the human communities also using these areas. Tigers are a top predator, and so one of the key areas of conflict between tigers and humans is when tigers try to attack livestock. The main livestock are kept by the communities surrounding national parks, by either water buffalo, cows, goats or chickens. But there's also lots of wild prey for tigers in these areas, such as chittal deer or langa monkeys. So are Nepalese tigers eating the local cows and goats? or are they relying on wild prey to a higher degree? To find out what tigers are eating, we can use a technique called DNA metabarcoding. And this is where the science and the poo comes in. The first step is to collect the sample. So someone has the glamorous job of collecting some tiger poo, taking a swab from it, and then we use that swab to extract DNA in the lab. We then amplify a particular sequence from a specific place in the genome. This is our barcode. It's a sequence that all species have, but that differs enough between species that we can use it to tell them apart. We take the sequence from the poo and we run it against our library of DNA sequences for different species. We're looking for a match. So if there's an exact match, we know that's what the tiger has been eating. You can see that in this case, the monkey sequence and the goat sequence don't match with the sequence from the poo, but the deer sequence matches exactly. And what that tells us is that this tiger has definitely had deer on its dinner menu. Before we can deploy a technique like this in the wild, we need to make sure that it works. And that's where being based at a zoo, where we have tigers as part of our collection, comes in super handy. How does this work? Well, we know exactly what our zoo tigers have been eating. So our amazing zookeepers can collect poo samples from them and we can use those to test whether our method works. I think this has been a great example of Wild Gene's unique position as a zoo-based laboratory. We are there to bridge the gap between captive animals and conservation of their wild counterparts. As with many of the conservation projects we run at RZSS, we work with amazing partners to make things happen. These partnerships are really important, especially in terms of building relationships with people working in the focal country where that species lives and where it's being protected. For conservation to be successful in the long term, I think it's really crucial that you get investment from people within the country where that wildlife needs protecting. This is where our partnership with CMDN becomes so crucial. We have a lab actually within the capital of Nepal, Kathmandu, invested and working on the conservation issues that they know within their country. We have a much 
greater impact and ability to conserve those wild tiger populations into the future. So, once we can go from faeces to species in the wild, what does that mean for tigers? If we find that a tiger is constantly eating uh, livestock of the local community, then potentially mitigation measures can be put in place for those communities. Can they better protect their livestock? Can that tiger be relocated to somewhere else within a national park where it's less likely to come into contact with humans? These are the kind of uh, strategies that can be implemented once we have a better idea of what tigers are feeding on and which tigers are eating uh, what kinds of prey within their territories. In this film, we've seen how our unique position as a conservation department with a genetics lab based in a zoo sets us up really well for helping conserve species in the wild. In the next episode of our ZSS Goes Wild, we're off to Uganda to see how our long-term partnership with a field station in the rainforest there is helping to protect some of our closest relatives, amazing chimpanzees. I will see you then.